Hello everyone. A multi-agent reinforcement learning just trains the craziest type of AI models. And in the next few minutes or so, we are diving deep into one of the most ingenious algorithms to train multi-agent AI behavior called self-play. It's a really simple algorithm that has achieved some extraordinary feats in my opinion, like training AIs to sumo wrestle, take penalty kicks, team-based hide and seek, the most advanced chess and Go AI like Leela Chess Zero and AlphaGo Zero, and even dominate competitive multiplayer games like Dota 2. So this is a follow-up to my previous video on RL. So if you haven't seen that, you should definitely check that out because some basic knowledge will definitely help you to understand this video a lot better. But if you're ready, let's get into this one and let's talk about what self-play is all about. So let's start simple and talk about 1v1 competitive multi-agent games. These can be divided into two major categories, symmetric and asymmetric. In symmetric 1v1 games, the two competing agents have similar abilities and are trying to accomplish the same goal. For example, strategic board games like chess or open AI sumo wrestling environment where two agents are trying to sumo wrestle each other out of the ring. In asymmetric environment, the agents either have different abilities or are trying to accomplish entirely different goals. Examples are OpenAI's you shall not pass environment where one agent is trying to reach the goal line and the other agent is trying to block him. Or the kick and defend environment where there is a kicker and a goalkeeper. So it turns out that training AI models for both symmetric and asymmetric multi-agent environment is a hard job and it poses many algorithmic challenges. First and foremost, the additional AI agents that are also concurrently training and improving their behavior makes the environment unpredictable, meaning a particular action that has led to a favorable result in the past may lead to a failure now because your opponent has gotten better at the game. And this is called non-stationary dynamics, which means that the agent has to constantly adapt to external factor that it cannot directly observe. It's like shooting at a goalpost that is always moving. The second problem with multi-agent RL is to balance opponent difficulty. So suppose you're trying to learn to play tennis with another person, but if your opponent is way too strong and he's destroying you every single game, it's impossible for you to find a win and learn what to do better. And similarly, if the opponent is way too weak, you are effortlessly beating them every time, you won't be able to learn how to improve your skills. That's exactly how it works even for multi-agent AI training. The two agents competing should roughly be of equal skill so that there is a balance of the positive and negative rewards that they see when they compete. A third challenge is that of skill diversity. It is not easy to ensure that the agents we train will be sufficiently versatile to handle a diverse range of possible counter strategies. If the AI's chess opponent only plays the same opening in every match, it won't learn how to play different opening strategies more than just that one. In self-play, the AI trains by playing against multiple previous versions of itself and learning how to defeat them. It's like learning chess by playing millions of games against younger clones of yourself and after you're sufficiently good enough, you kind of save the current version of you as a clone and then train to defeat this new clone and just continue this cycle a number of times till you've mastered the game of chess. So with that intuition in mind, let's look at some of the under the hood details of how self-play works and how it addresses all of the three challenges that I mentioned of multi-agent RL. To start off, let's take an example of a symmetric game like sumo wrestling. Here the AI and his adversary are trying to accomplish the same task and there is no distinction between the rules of the individuals. It's a symmetric environment, therefore we can train a single policy network that independently controls the behaviors of both these agents. So let's call this policy network M0 and also initialize a list called clones and put M0 into that list. So don't worry about the clones list for now, I'm going to come back to it in a minute. We provide a copy of M0 to both agent A and agent B and then let them play the game using this policy network. When one agent falls from the platform, they get a reward of minus 1000 and the winner gets a reward of plus 1000. After playing a number of games, say 50 matches, we accumulate all the experiences collected by one of the two agents, say agent A, and train the policy network with any reinforcement learning algorithm where you pass in your current policy network and the history of the positive and negative experiences you saw and the black box spits out an updated policy network that is a little bit smarter at picking actions that maximizes the probability of positive experiences in the future. 
Basically, we now have a slightly smarter policy network thanks to all of the experiences we collected. Let's call this network M0.1. Now we're going to use M0.1 to collect more experiences in the game, but this is where things get a little bit interesting. Instead of updating both agencies' network with M0.1, we keep agent B fixed at M0 and only upgrade agent A. Now the two agents, controlled by different policies, play more matches and Agent A retrains the network to M0.2, M0.3 and until say after 10 epochs, we graduate the model from M0.9 to M1. And this M1 model now goes into the clones window. As we go into the next iteration of gameplay collection, Agent B's AI can be randomly assigned with any of the models from the clones list. Let's randomly pick the brand new M1 model. So Agent A now has to compete against a much stronger Agent B controlled by the M1 model. After say every 20 matches, Agent B can randomly switch back to M0 or remain at M1. Agent A on the other hand goes through the model updates via training and upgrades itself from M1 to M1.1 all the way to M2. Again, this M2 model now goes into the clones list, the new epoch begins, Agent A starts with the latest greatest M2 model, but Agent B can randomly switch between M0, M1, M2 every 20 games. As training continues and more and more major versions of the policy network start to come forward, we start removing the older models from the clones window. And that's how self-play works in a repeated loop. Fix Agent B to be controlled by one of the saved policy networks, play the game, collect experiences for Agent A update the network for Agent A, add the new network to the list of safe clones for Agent B to randomly pick up, and so goes on the loop. Okay, so that was a lot of information, but what does all of this really mean? To understand this, let's go back to that earlier slide about the challenges with multi-agent RL training. The first point was multi-agent RL environment tend to be non-stationary. Self-play addresses this by fixing one of the agents for a large number of steps, in our example for 20 matches, where agent B's AI is going to be fixed, just making it temporarily stationary and stable enough to learn. This is a very important hyperparameter. Leaving it too high will mean that the agent will overfit the behavior of that single model by constantly beating him and not be able to improve his skills. And leaving it too low will bring back the non-stationary problem where the environment is constantly changing and the goalpost is constantly moving. The second point we talked about was that of balancing the difficulty of the opponent. Well, self-play addresses this by using that clones window where we maintain the snapshots of recently trained policy networks. This basically means that agent A will always be facing another agent that is of a similar skill level and have the right amount of challenge. Thirdly, because Agent B is randomly selected from a clone's list and not a single clone, Agent A will be facing multiple clones than just one, learning to play against a variety of strategies instead of just one. And the results are fascinating as the robots indulge in some cool sumo wrestling. With some minor changes to the self-play algorithm, we can even make it work for asymmetric environments. If you understood the symmetric environment case, the asymmetric case will be easier to understand. The catch is that we need to have two different policy networks, one that works for agent A and another that works for agent B. And this means that we also use two different clones list, one for agent A and one for agent B. And as usual, we update the latest model of a single agent, say agent A, while agent B is periodically updated with a random model chosen from the clones list. After a fixed number of matches, say 1000 matches, we switch the learning agent, meaning agent B will now be training and collecting experiences, while agent A will remain fixed and periodically update itself from its previous clones. And with that iterative algorithm, we achieve some amazing and complex AI behavior from a simple environment like you shall not pass. Like not too long ago in this channel, I was creating a Unity game, which was this two player kind of a 1v1 game where they were shooting bullets at each other and the goal of the game was to dodge those bullets and hit the opponent. And I saw some really amazing strategies and gameplay just by letting these two agents play in a self-play loop. The addition of the multiple agents into the environment sort of sparks this intrinsic motivation to explore and to improve. And this often leads to intelligent and novel and creative behavior that has never failed to impress me. So that's been my time guys. I am going to wrap this video up and go editing. Uh, do share this video with your friends, leave a comment below. Don't forget to subscribe because if you like this video, you're going to love my next one. You've been magnificent. Take care.